Here we are. Hi, Tim. Hi there. Glad to see you. Glad to see you I'm too. I'm Tim, your guide to Art Rageous. You know? And I've been waiting to show you the neighborhood. Yes. Right, right now. Shut up, Tim. Okay, I'm going to go into the obelisk here because this is what we're looking for. We're looking for paintings. We're going to go through all the paintings, learn lots of new things, read some biographies, and it's going to be a fun time, y'all. So let's go here. Today, we're going to be looking at paintings starting with C. All right, we have some exciting paintings here today. We're going to start right off with Camera Obscura. One tool that was invented to help the artist draw clearly in perspective was the Camera Obscura, which means dark chamber in Latin. The original Camera Obscura really was a darkened room. All the doors and curtains were closed, so no light entered the room except through a pinhole. An image of the outside world is automatically projected through the pinhole, upside down, on the opposite wall. Wow! As it developed, the Camera Obscura was made smaller and more portable, so that artists could use it outdoors or in an indoor setting for portrait painting. Mirrors were used to turn the image right side up, and a lens was added to focus the image on a sheet of paper. The artist could then trace the scene, accurately copying the perspective, as well as the shadows and colors. The Camera Obscura ultimately developed into the photographic camera, which would also have a tremendous effect on the creation of art. Wow, that is some really interesting history, especially for photographers. Really, really cool. All right, here we are, back in the menu. We're gonna take a look at Camera Degli Spussi from Mantegna. Let's check it out right now. This painting by Andrea Mantegna was created on the ceiling of a room in a palace in Italy. We're meant to look straight up at it from below. Mantegna took advantage of this fact to create a humorous scene. With Cupid standing on what seems to be the edge of a painted rim, and one woman smiling down as though she's tempted to move that pole and let the planter come crashing down on us. The illusion of a hole in the ceiling is an example of what is called in French trompe l'huile, or deceiving the eye. Mantegna was copying the Romans, who really built the ceiling of their main hall with a hole in it. This painting was meant to create the same visual impression. When you look at the painting, you can turn around 360 degrees, and the painting is always entertaining. Click with your mouse to rotate the painting and see for yourself. Let's check it out. Okay. Yeah, we're looking down at this. There's some women looking at us. Got a big pot of plant, potted plant. We got some older people here. Let's keep it moving. Right now, you see the baby. He actually has a little pee-pee. Also, he has a angelic thing over there. And here's his friend, another angel. Let's keep it moving. Another naked baby and a baby sticking his head out through a hole. That looks kind of weird. Right here, we have an angel with what looks like a paintbrush. We have... A big big bird and here's a baby butt with angel wings and another angel and another head coming out to the side here let's keep it moving this could be the mother very uh, young lady here um, with uh, some more uh, people here yeah, it's quite interesting, quite interesting. So, let's uh, go to the life of the painter. This is uh, Andrea Mantegna. He's an Italian Renaissance painter, engraver, actively chiefly in Padua and Mantua, where some of his frescoes remain. Paintings such as The Agony in the Garden of about 1455 reveal a dramatic linear style, mastery of perspective, and strongly classical architectural detail. Mantegna was born in Vicenza. Early works include frescoes for the 
Eremitani Church in Padua, painted during the 1440s, badly damaged during World War II. From 1460, he worked for Ludovico Gonzaga in Mantua and produced an outstanding fresco series in the Ducal Palace in the 1470s and later the Triumphs of Caesar. And uh, the sculptor Donatello, in turn, uh, influenced the Venetian painter Giovanni Bellini, his brother-in-law, and the German artist Albrecht Durer. Here are the stats of this painting. It's a fresco painting. That is the type, style, or technique used on this painting. It is from 1474. Well, let's keep this moving here. This painting by Andrea Mon... Welcome to Viewing Position. This paint. Here we are, back in the index. We're going to take a look at the next painting here, Chatre by Newman. Acrylics oh. were invented in the 1950s and created a revolution in painting comparable to the invention of oil paints 500 years ago. This painting by Barnett Newman is called Chartres, like the great French cathedral. It's 10 feet tall in real life. Newman said he wanted to use a triangle, but somehow keep the shape invisible, and maybe its large size accomplishes that. In Newman's paintings, the simplicity of the composition makes each element important. Acrylics are extremely versatile. You thin them with water, but when they're dry, they're waterproof. You can use them like watercolors in thin downed washes or build them up into thick impastos like oil paint. They can be clear or opaque. You can use them on almost any surface. Only glass and metal are too smooth to hold acrylic paint. Gotta love that jazz music. Let's check out the life of this painter. No picture of this guy. Well, anyway, well, Barnett Newman he was born in 1905, so no, no photo of this guy. He was a U.S. painter, sculptor, and theorist. He believed that modern art must make a total break with tradition and find new subject matter to paint. Newman wanted an ideal art whose images did not look like or refer to anything we can see around us. His paintings are solid colored canvases with a few sparse vertical stripes called zips. These, the paintings represent a mystical pursuit of simple or elemental art. His sculpture, such as Broken Obelisk, consists of geometrical shapes, each mounted on top of each other. Let's get back to the index. Gotta love, anyway, gotta love that jazz music. Yes, now we're gonna look at Cheat with Ace from De La Tour. In this painting, the cheat with the Ace of Diamonds by Georges de la Tour, the artist has conveyed the sheen of the woman's pearl necklace, the sparkle of her diamond earring, the down of the feather, the natural skin texture of this player's hands. The woman in the center looks so pale because it was the fashion then for women to powder their skin. The ability to accurately show such a wide variety of textures was one of the great advances of oil paint, which developed in the early 1400s and has been the most popular painting medium for the last 500 years. It's easy to understand why oil painting is so popular. It is very beautiful indeed. The details are amazing, the colors are vibrant, and it's really nice. So let's take a look at the life of this painter. Georges de la Tour was a French painter active in Lorraine. He was patronized by the Duke of Lorraine, Richelieu, and perhaps also by Louis VIII. Many of his pictures are illuminated by a single source of light with deep contrasts of light and shade. As in Joseph the Carpenter of about 1645, they range from religious paintings to domestic genre scenes. Get back to the index. Now we're going to check out Children's Games by Bruegel. Whoops, this painting seems to break the rules. 
In Bruegel's children's games, our eye isn't led to any one center of attention. The points of interest, the children playing, are scattered across the whole picture, and our eyes seem to skip around without finding a pattern. But if we look closely, we can see that there are in fact a couple of compositional schemes at work here. The street to the right and the fence at the left form lines that lead our eye. While the children at play are grouped in circles and lines that help guide us through the painting. The composition is hidden. The artist has not created one single focal point, but that's because his aim here is to lead you to examine a large, confusing arena, not to tell one quick story. Well, this is a very neat painting, just because it's very different. And those subtle hints of lines and circles and zigzags make this painting very well constructed, and there's a lot of detail here. Very good painting indeed. Let's check out the life of the painter. Here he is, funny looking guy. Uh, he was born in the 1500s and uh, his uh, Bruegel, or Bruegel, family of Flemish painters, Peter Bruegel and the elder, was one of the greatest artists of his time. His pictures of peasant life helped to establish genre painting. And he also popularized works illustrating proverbs such as the blind leading the blind, Contemporary taste for the macabre can be seen in The Triumph of Death, which clearly shows the influence of Hieronymus Bosch. One of his best-known works is Hunters in the Snow. The elder Peter was nicknamed Peasant Bugel. Two of his sons were painters. Peter Bugel, the younger, called Hell Bugel, specialized in religious subjects. And another son, uh, John Bugel, called Velvet Bugel, painted flowers, landscapes, and seascapes. Now we're going to check out Christ Bearing the Cross by El Greco. In El Greco's Christ Bearing the Cross, Jesus is dressed in the heraldic colors red and blue, but the tones used are oddly unnatural, as if the artist wants to aim beyond the physical reality to something spiritually illuminated. It is also unclear where the light source is in the painting. El Greco is classified with the Mannerist school of painters. The Mannerists reacted against the calmness and idealization of reality typical in the Renaissance and brought emotionality and expressionistic use of color and form into their art. Notice how Jesus' body has been elongated for effect such distortions of shape are matched by distortions of color, as in the strange mixture of pigments used in the sky. Well, this is, uh, I like that Jesus is uh, well illuminated in the face, it, and uh, especially his expression looks very nice. He looks uh, very nice, good, good guy, looks really nice. And uh, it's interesting with the use of the uh, color green to, like he said, to give it an otherworldly spiritual feeling. Um, it's pretty good. Let's check out the life of the painter. Here he is. El Greco. Looks like a uh, Greek name there. He was a Spanish painter called the Greek because he was born in Crete. He studied in Italy, worked in Rome from about 1570, and by 1577 had settled in Toledo. He painted elegant portraits and intensely emotional religious scenes with increasingly distorted figures and flickering of light, for example. The burial of Count Orgas. So, let's go back to the index. Here's composition three by Mark. You've arrived at playing with art. Oh. Uh-oh. Somebody ruined this painting, Composition 3 by Franz Marc. Oh. Your challenge is to restore it. How'd this happen? Click and drag the pieces to where you think they belong. Wait a second. Let me if just check if this was uh, correct. Because I was uh, going to go in and look at Composition number 3 by Marc. You've arrived at playing with okay. art. Could be a bug. Uh-oh. 
No. Somebody ruined this Says meeting. Right Composition here. three okay. by Franz Mark. Let's do it. Your challenge is to restore it. Click and drag the pieces to where you think they belong. This if be too they hard. fit, they'll snap into place. Choose the level of difficulty you want to try. Oh, well, I'll just go for intermediate. You have 50 seconds to restore oh, this painting. That's Good luck. Got to be fast. Got to be fast. Okay, here we go. Not too hard, luckily. Mm, where we go there? Oh, my time is running out. Gotta be quick, gotta be quick. Gotta be quick here. Oh no. Don't panic. Oh, I'm not gonna make this. Didn't know I had to be this quick. Almost there. Close, but no cigar. Oh. Try again. No, I'm not going to try again. Okay. Let's go back to the index. Here's Composition by Kadinsky. Is this another one of these games? You've arrived at color and music. Is there a relationship between music and colors? Hmm. Artist Vasily Kandinsky, generally considered the father of modern abstract art, thought there was. He developed an entire system of correlations between music, colors, and ideas. Even the title of this painting, Composition 7, is like the name of a piece of music. Click on the colors in the painting to make the music Kandinsky might have heard. Hmm. Now this is interesting. Okay, I'm clicking on the colors. Nothing's happening. So, is this a bug? Okay, it doesn't work. That sounded fun, too. Kandinsky had specific ideas about how colors sound. We've used some of his own words to help explain them. Yellow. The shrill canary and the sour lemon, both yellow. An insistent, aggressive quality. Intensification of the color increases its painful shrillness. Blue. Profound meaning here, said Kandinsky. The heavenly color. A light blue is like a flute. A darker blue, a cello. A still darker blue, a thunderous double bass. And the darkest blue of all, an organ. When it sinks almost to black, it echoes a grief that is hardly human. Green, the most restful color that exists, but self-satisfied, immovable, narrow. In music, an absolute green is represented by the placid middle notes of the violin. Red, a cold light red, the singing notes of a violin. A light warm red, the sound of trumpets, strong, harsh, and ringing. Violet, a cooled red, rather sad and ailing an English horn or a bassoon, orange, a man convinced of his own powers, an angelus or an old violin, brown, unemotional, disinclined for movement, barely audible, add red to increase its voice, the vermilion now rings like a great trumpet or thunders like a drum, white, the symbol of a world too far above us for its harmony to touch our souls, white has the appeal of the nothingness that is before birth, of the world in the Ice Age, symbolizes joy and purity. The colors of the rainbow spring out without any sound. Black, a totally dead silence, a silence with no possibilities. Black is something burnt out, like the ashes of a funeral pyre. The silence of death. Man, that was really cool and interesting. That's worth, you know, running back and rewinding because that was cool. So. You guys can do that when you guys watch the video. Right now, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go back here, and check out the life of this painter. Ah, that's relaxing classical music. Well, Wassily Kadinsky was Russian and a pioneer of abstract art. Abstract art, very cool. 
Born in Moscow, he, tra he traveled widely, setting in Munich in 1896. Between 1910 and 1914, he produced the series Improvisations and Compositions, the first known examples of purely abstract work in the 20th century art. He was an originator of the Blue Reiter movement from 1911 1912. From 1921, he taught at the Bauhaus School of Design. He moved to Paris in 1933, becoming a French citizen. Kadinsky originally experimented with post impressionist styles and fauvism. His highly colored works had few imitators, but his theories on com composition, published in Concerning the Spiritual in Art, were taken up by the abstractionists. Okay, so next we're going to check out Composition in Red, Yellow, and Blue by Mondrian. Some people criticize modern art for being cut off from the concerns of great art of the past. But even Piet Mondrian, one of the most modern of modern artists, shows the influence of the Greeks' golden proportion. Interesting how he managed to do that. Okay. Hmm. I really wouldn't have noticed that. Mondrian composed this famous painting using golden rectangles, a very classical project for such an avant-garde painter. Avant-garde. Some very avant-garde piano playing right here. Very funky little jazz. So, let's check out the stats. This is oil on canvas. You can uh, go check it out in New York. Let's check out the life of this painter. Piet Mondrian was a Dutch painter, pioneer of abstract art. He lived in Paris from 1919 to 1938, then in London from 1940 in New York. He was a founder of member of the Distille movement and chief exponent of neoplasticism, a rigorous abstract style based on the use of simple geometrical forms and pure colors. He typically created a framework using a vertical and horizontal lines and filled the rectangles with primary colors, mid-gray or black, others being left white. His composition in red and yellow and blue from 1920 is typical of that style. So let's head back to the index. And now we're going to check out Conversions of St. Paul by Caravaggio. The artist Caravaggio's Conversion of St. Paul is an illustration of the New Testament story of the Apostle Paul's spiritual transformation on the road to Damascus. Caravaggio uses light here in three ways. The brilliance of the light is carefully modeled to illuminate a realistic scene. But the light is also, in a way, the subject here. Paul's arms are opened in an ecstasy to welcome the divine light, even while his servant and the dumb horse remain partly in shadow and see nothing. Light and the contrast between the light and the dark is also used to heighten the drama. Thus, light shows the painter's mastery of his craft, even while it becomes the symbol of the event. Why is that horse walking over Paul? And why is Paul so dumb to lie down underneath the horse? That is not smart. But the horse is really nice. It looks like he's stepping over, trying to be really careful not to step on him. Nice horse, not a dumb horse like the guy said. Really nice horse, smart, smart horse. This is an oil painting, as you can see. And uh, it was from uh, what year? It painted this year right here. Let's check out the life of the painter. Mich Michelangelo Marisi da Caravaggio was an Italian early Baroque painter active in Rome from 1592 to 1606, then in Naples and finally in Malta. He created a forceful style using contrasts of light and shade, dramatic foreshortening, and a meticulous attention to detail. His life was dramatic as his art, and he had to leave Rome after killing a man in a brawl. Born in Caravaggio near Milan, his early works were genre paintings incorporating vivid still life details and central portraits of young men. He later turned to religious works using contemporary settings and non-idolized portraits of men and women from the lower walks of Roman life 
as saints and madonnas. As in Death of the Virgin, he had a number of direct imitators and several Dutch and Flemish, Flemish artists who visited him in Rome, including Honthorst and Terbrugelen, which were inspired by him. Let's head back to the index. And now we're going to look at the last painting in the letter C, Creation of Adam by Michelangelo. This should be interesting. Fresco is the art of painting on plaster while the plaster is still wet. As the plaster dries, the painting becomes part of the wall and will last as long as the wall does. You can't make corrections when you paint as you can when painting with oils. If you make a mistake, you have to chip off the plaster and start over again, so the artist works on small sections at a time. This portion of Michelangelo's huge fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome is called the creation of man. Like any wall or ceiling, it has deteriorated since it was commissioned in 1508. Mold, water, dirt, the smoke of the stoves that were used to heat the chapel, and pollution all took their toll. In 1990, a team of experts completed more than a decade of painstaking restoration to achieve what art critics and historians believe was the fresco's original look, with colors much more lively and bright than viewers had for centuries accepted as Michelangelo's original intention. Now this is one of those classics. It's a great painting. Um, most people have seen this for sure. What's cool about these, this painting here, the creation of the first human, is I like how they are very strong. Strong in their muscles and in mind and spirit and the muscles look at the muscle on uh, on this guy here and this old guy still working out hard you can tell so I like that I like that a lot and uh, like you said this painting was done in one try no erasing so let's check out the life of Michelangelo should be interesting he's one of those classic painters one of the most famous and he's a funny looking guy with no eyeballs, but that's funny. Okay. Michel Michelangelo Bernotti. He was an Italian sculptor, painter and architect and poet active in his native Florence and in Rome. His giant talent dominated in the high Renaissance. The Marble David set a new standard in nude sculpture. The Marble David, many have seen that. Most people have seen that. Very, very famous indeed. His famous figure style was translated into fresco in the Sistine Chapel. Other works in Rome include the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. That should be impressive, sounds impressive. His influence, particularly on the development of mannerism, was profound. Born near Florence, he was a student of Girardello and trained under the patronage of Lorenzo de Medici. His patrons later included several popes and Medici princes. In uh, 1898 to 99, he completed the Pieta, a technically brilliant marble sculpture that established his reputation. Also in Rome, he began the great tomb, tomb of Pope Julius II. The slaves and Moses were sculpted for this unfinished project. His grandiose scheme for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, that's the Sistine Chapel, guys. That's real famous tells the Old Testament story from Genesis to, Delu to the Deluge. And on the altar wall, he later added a vast and dramatic last judgment. From 1516 to 1534, he began, uh, was in Florence, where his chief work was the design of the Medici Sepulchral Chapel in San Lorenzo. Returning to Rome, he became chief architect of St. Peter's in 1547. His friendship with Vittoria Colonna and a noble, a noble woman inspired many of his sonnets and madrigals. There are collections of his paintings in Uffizi, Florence, and the Louvre in Paris. So, now we just finished out the paintings in C. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, subscribe to the channel 
if you want to see paintings in the letter D, we're going to be going through the alphabet and also looking at all the other things this game has to offer, which is quite a bit. So, see you guys in the next one.